Next item of business is topical questions, and our first question comes from Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what analysis it made of the reported level of support for independence ahead of the decision to bring forward the referendum bill before Article 50 had been invoked. Minister Michael Russell. Oh, Minister Derek Mackay, is it? Uh, Cabinet Secretary. Our starting point remains protecting Scotland's national interests as set out by the First Minister. We're considering all possible options to ensure Scotland's continuing relationship with and place in Europe. Scotland delivered a strong, unequivocal vote to remain, and our focus is on ensuring that Scotland's interests are protected, particularly as it appears that the UK Government now favours a hard Brexit. The consultation on the draft bill launched last week is about the mechanics of the referendum. Should we conclude that independence is the best or only way to protect Scotland's interests? Oliver Mundell. So I take it from that answer, the, the real answer is none. Uh, but uh, does he agree with me that in pushing ahead with the bill, uh, as the government plans to do as its number one priority, before even listening to his own party's listening exercise, exposes the SNP's true colours and true intentions, independence at any cost? Cabinet Secretary. Well, th th this government is listening. This government is engaging. This government is consulting, but this government is also acting, acting in Scotland's national interest, and that's what we will do each and every day. That is our day job, standing up for Scotland against a hard right Tory Brexit that will impact on the economy of this country. So we will do what is best for Scotland. And if you want to talk about opinion poll ratings, that's fine. I welcome the most recent opinion poll that, poll that showed that 51% of people in Scotland would support the SNP in a Scottish Parliament constituency election. That's more than all the political parties in Scotland put together. No wonder the people of Scotland trust the SNP. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oliver so if we want to talk about public opinion, why is it that uh, his government are so keen to ignore the two million no voters who made their intentions crystal clear and why is it that the SNP are so keen to airbrush out of history the one million no voters in this country more than voted and put their cross next to Nicola Sturgeon for first minister and if he is saying what I think he's saying that this legislation might not be needed the question is how much taxpayers money has been spent on the publication and preparation of this bill and under what illegal authority has that money been spent? Cameron Secretary. Uh, it is clear that the, the Scottish Government has a mandate to consider this. It was clearly outlined in the elections in the manifesto where the SNP secured victory in that election to form the Scottish uh, Government. And you know, when Oliver Mundell wants to talk about the cost of policies, do you realise does Mr Mundell realise what the cost of Brexit is to the whole of the United Kingdom as well uh, as Scotland? And in terms of respecting this nation, because Scotland is not just a constituency, it is a nation. Every part of this nation, every local authority area voted to remain within Europe. And that's what should be respected by the UK government. Now, the ball is in the court of the UK government to respect Scotland and respect how the people voted. And if they do that, then maybe we can find a solution that works for every part of the UK. Here's a Scottish government that's not just standing up for Scotland, but actually trying to help the whole of the UK. So the UK Prime Minister could react positively and constructively, but first and foremost, respect Scotland's interest and the democracy of this country. Yeah. Question number two, James Dornan. To ask the Scottish Government how it will take forward plans for the minimum pricing of alcohol following the decision by the Court of Session. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. The Scottish Government intends to implement minimum unit pricing as soon as possible. The order bringing minimum pricing in must first be laid in draft before the Scottish Parliament for approval before it can be made by Scottish Ministers. While we respect the right of the Scotch Whisky Association to seek permission to appeal the judgment, I hope it will accept it, enabling us to get on with implementing this life-saving policy. The member will be aware that I am limited in discussing the case due to the Parliament's guidance on sub judice. James Dornan. 
I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, and I am aware of the restrictions placed on her, but can she tell me what research into the public health benefits of this policy have the Scottish Government reviewed? Cabinet Secretary. Well, minimum unit pricing is uh, underpinned by a wealth of international evidence on the public health benefit, which has been before this Parliament on a, a number of occasions and indeed before the Court. Uh, just today, we've seen the publication of alcohol-related hospital statistics, which show that the rate of admissions remains four times higher than it was in the earlier 1980s, adding further to the need for this life-saving policy, which, as I said earlier, I hope we can introduce as soon as possible. James Doran. I uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary again. Uh, and the figures, the, the facts that she gave us there just show the importance of this piece of legislation. Uh, I look forward to the industry, Dink's industry now respecting the will of Parliament and allowing those life-saving measures to be introduced without further delay. But can the Minister outline what other measures the Scottish Government is taking forward in conjunction with minimum pricing to address Scotland's relationship with alcohol? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, of course, uh, we have a, a very comprehensive strategy to tackle alcohol-related harm in Scotland. It contains 41 measures, including minimum unit pricing, but other measures include the multi-buy discount ban, uh, which <laughs> has seen a reduction of 2.6% in consumption. Uh, there's been a nationwide programme of alcohol brief interventions, which has uh, delivered over 667,000 uh, since the uh, introduction back in 2008. We've improved substance misuse education. We've uh, legislated to ban irresponsible promotions. And of course, uh, more recently introduced uh, a lower drink drive limit. So a lot has been done, but we are certainly not going to be complacent. And we're working on a refresh of the alcohol framework, which we'll introduce soon. Donald Cameron. Does the Cabinet Secretary accept that a crucial part of the Inner House's judgment was its approval of the provisional or trial nature of the legislation and that the sunset clause argued for by the Scottish Conservatives is integral to that? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, uh, I respect all of the, the judgment that has uh, been made. Um, and of course, I welcome the cross-party support that we've seen uh, for this very, very important uh, public health uh, measure. I hope, though, that Donald Cameron will join me in hoping that we will now get the opportunity to implement this uh, important uh, life-saving legislation. And as I said in my earlier uh, answer, I would uh, uh, hope that the uh, Scottish Whiskey Association will accept the uh, the, the judgment, uh, enabling us to get on with the job of introducing this public health uh, policy and that all of us will get behind uh, making sure it works for the people of Scotland. Question number three, Kezia Dugdale. You asked the Scottish Government whether it will quash the convictions and cautions issued to people for now abolished gay sexual offences and issue pardons. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Can I thank Kezia Dugdale for raising this important issue? It is sadly the case that Scotland has only relatively recently modernised how our criminal laws operate so that they no longer discriminate against same-sex sexual activity. It is shocking to consider that consensual sex between men was only decriminalised in Scotland in 1980. And the age of consent for same-sex sexual activity was not equalised with sexual activity between men and women until 2001. Thankfully, we can now look back at the operation of these discriminatory laws, knowing that they no longer operate with a sense of pride. Such laws clearly have no place in a modern, inclusive Scotland. However, there are people in Scotland who have criminal convictions for same-sex sexual activity, which is now lawful, and we must right this wrong. Over the summer, I instructed officials to look at the necessary steps that would need to be taken in Scotland to correct this injustice. I can therefore advise Parliament that we will introduce an automatic pardon for people convicted so that they know they are absolved fully of that conviction. We want to address the injustice that people experience simply because of their sexual orientation in circumstances 
that are now legal. And the granting of an automatic pardon is one way of achieving this. Separately, it is the case that information on these convictions is held on records maintained by Police Scotland. And we have engaged with Police Scotland over the summer to seek views on steps that could be taken to right these historic wrongs. I have therefore instructed my officials working in partnership with Police Scotland to determine the practical steps required to establish a scheme that will allow men convicted for actions that are now legal to have those convictions disregarded. This scheme will ensure that convictions for activity that is now lawful are removed from central conviction records. Where an offence is disregarded, a person will be treated as not having been convicted of that offence, and so it would not appear on, for example, disclosure checks. So, an officer, I know that Parliament will want to work together to resolve these important issues. Kezia Dugdale. President officer, that is a hugely welcome announcement. In fact, it's nothing short of a historic moment for Scotland to be uh, a more equal and respectful country. The Minister will be aware that there are many men across the United Kingdom who have been prosecuted, convicted and in some cases imprisoned for who they are and who they love. Uh, and a pardon is therefore the very least that the government of the day can do. Uh, given the significance of that announcement, President officer, I hope you'll forgive me for, for three very quick questions. Can the Minister confirm that this would be a blanket pardon for any gay or bisexual man who has been convicted of a crime that is no longer a crime? Secondly, can the Minister confirm that no legislation is required for such a pardon and indeed that those affected need not apply to be pardoned, as has been argued elsewhere in the United Kingdom? And finally, obviously, the Scottish Government is not responsible for these laws, was not responsible for the prosecutions, the convictions or indeed the sentences that gay men faced. But they could issue a formal apology which would go a long way for many people and recognise they should never have accepted liability for this in the first place. Mm. And for many men, an apology is as important as a pardon mm. because an apology demonstrates they should never have been convicted for a crime in the first place. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Second officer, I'll try to deal with each of these issues in turn uh, for the member. On the issue of the blanket pardon, it will be an automatic pardon for those offences which are where individuals were convicted uh, for offences which are now lawful. It's important we have a system in place which also recognises that there were individuals who were convicted using the old criminal law, which are matters which remain a, a criminal offences. So that's why we will create a system which will allow that to happen. So it will take place on an automatic basis uh, for those who were convicted of crimes which are now lawful. It, for the provision of an automatic pardon, we will require legislation in which to do so. Uh, what we will do is seek to bring forward legislation at an early date in this Parliament uh, over the course of the next year, at the very least, uh, to make sure that we make progress in this matter swiftly. With regards to the disregard, that is an issue which we can take forward as a practical policy measure and may not require to have legislation for its implementation and therefore will seek to make progress on that as quickly as possible. I fully acknowledge the issue about the righting of the wrongs of those who were convicted, some of whom were imprisoned as a result of the offences which they, uh, which they uh, were convicted of and which are now lawful. Uh, and I do think the issue of an apology is an appropriate measure that government should give consideration to. Uh, my view, that would be best dealt with in a collective way when we look at bringing forward further legislation in this parliament on the matter of a pardon. And I'll certainly give that serious consideration as being part of that package of measures which we'll take forward. Patrick Harvey. Uh, can I welcome the question from Ked Dugdale and also the answer from the Cabinet Secretary very much. Uh, just to reinforce that final point regarding the importance of an apology, does the Cabinet Secretary appreciate that while many will welcome a pardon, others take from it an implication that they are being forgiven for having done something wrong? And that is not the message that should be sent out, but that the government also has a responsibility to acknowledge that the state is the body which has acted wrongly by enacting laws based on such 
uh, values that we would regard now as completely immoral. So can I just reinforce the importance for many people in this situation that the apology comes alongside any pardon so as to ensure that it is not misinterpreted? I recognise the very point that the member has made because uh, the state has uh, been responsible uh, for creating this situation in the first place. But I do believe that the most appropriate way in which to take the matter of any apology forward and to consider the issue of an apology would be alongside uh, any legislation which we intend to bring forward for the introduction of an automatic uh, pardon. But I do recognise uh, the sentiments and the points raised by the member and they will be part of our thinking and how we bring forward the legislation in the coming months. Douglas Ross. Sorry, thank you, Presiding Officer. And could I associate the Scottish Conservatives with the remarks that have been made? The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that there is cross-party support uh, for what is being proposed throughout the United Kingdom uh, and indeed in this Parliament. But he'll also be aware that the developments down south last week uh, and you know, the case put forward by one of his party members, the issue about the blanket ban was difficult because down south there were concerns that it would cover um, offences that are still illegal. So he mentioned in his second remark to Ms Dugdale about creating a system to ensure that doesn't happen. Could he provide Parliament with more information on how he envisages taking that element forward? Cabinet Secretary. I, can I think, um, uh, I welcome the fact that the member has recognised this is an issue which has got cross-party support. I'm sure the member will also recognise there was provision in my colleague John Nicholson's bill to yeah. deal with the issue yeah. of offences yeah. yeah. which were committed previously which remain criminal offences. And I do regret the approach that's been taken by the UK <laughs> government on this particular Absolutely. issue. I, I think they could have worked harder to ensure that cross-party agreement was achieved on that matter. Setting that aside, though, is that there are clearly offences which were individuals were convicted on previously under the old criminal law in this area. And what we need to do is to make sure that the pardon arrangements which we put in place make provision so that these individuals continue to have these offences on their record and they will not receive a pardon. And Parliament will be given the opportunity to consider how the legislation seeks to achieve that while also delivering the automatic pardon to those who are entitled to it to being delivered. Thank you. And that concludes topical questions.